Right, I think we're ready to start. Um, so good evening, everybody, um, and welcome to those in the room and those who have joined us by the Zoom. Um, for the Zoomers, it's going to be a slightly frustrating evening, I'm sorry, because it's going to be a lot of wine flowing in the room, um, which you, you'll just have to imagine. Um, but take a note, and then you can go buy your, your bottles um, and, and follow up later on. Um, but before we get started with um, La Pomace, I just do the usual of um, a little bit of information about what's coming up. Um, I should have said hello and welcome to the British Institute of Florence for the Wednesday lecture. I'm Simon Gamel, the director of the Institute. Um, so tomorrow evening, we've got a really very good concert here tomorrow in the room, uh, in the library. I'm afraid it's not going to be streamed, so you have to be here in person. Um, a young Yorkshireman called Thomas Kelly um, who is emerging very fast indeed in the UK scene. He's been playing the Wigmore Hall and other venues, and the people who've heard him are, are really very excited by this guy. Um, and he's playing Rachmaninoff and Schubert for us tomorrow night. Um, so if you like good music in a beautiful room, with some more Matze wine, because Matze are our par wine partners for the whole season now. So if you like the wine tonight, there'll be more tomorrow at the concert. So that's an incentive, even if you don't like the music. <laughs> but the music's going to be fabulous. So um, do consider coming along to that one. Um, then next Wednesday, next week's Wednesday lecture is uh, Jeremy Boudreau, well known to many, our head of the History Art Program. And he's giving us a lecture all about uh, the Italian version of the Monuments Men. So it was what happened to the art treasures in Florence during the Second World War where they were hidden around the countryside and then retrieved and brought back to the city. And all those stories uh, will be explored uh, next week in, in uh, Jeremy's lecture, which is entitled Bunkered, Buried, Bricked and Bandaged, Florentine Art During the Liberation of Italy. Uh, strongly recommended. Um, now, also you should know that we're underway with the new space downstairs, Soto El British, uh, in the Sala Hernig, in the old ground floor room with the street access at number 15. Uh, and there's pretty much events most evenings there. Uh, there's talks. Monday night, there's a life drawing class for anyone who's interested in brushing up their drawing skills. That's a great opportunity. Uh, later tonight, there's an open mic where people are going along to tell jokes, read poems, play songs they've composed, uh, stories, whatever. That, I think, kicks off at about 8.30 tonight downstairs. Um, so there's a whole new program underway, which um, may be of interest, very much a, a Soto al British because it's different to what happens up here. It's contemporary, it's community, it's innovative, it's new ideas. Um, so that's all the stuff that's going on, all in the what's on as usual and on the website. Um, so that's the commercials. Now it's my great pleasure to uh, introduce my friend Lapa Matze. Um, Thank you. Who is the uh, director of all the retail activities in the Matze uh, family wine uh, business. Uh, including the restaurant downstairs, Belguardo. Um, he's the boss down there. So if you don't like the spaghetti, you better talk to Lapo. Uh, but <laughs> uh, it's doing very well. It's a good restaurant. I strongly recommend it. We go there all the time. Um, but I'm now going to hand over to Lapo, who's going to take us through the story of the Matze and also uh, guide us through tasting the four of their great wines. Thank you, Matze. So good evening, ladies and gentlemen. First of all, thank you for coming and uh, thank you to the British Institute to welcome us here tonight. So it's my pleasure to introduce you the, a bit of the history of my family and then our wines, because it's thanks to my ancestor, to what uh, they have done uh, in the latest centuries that actually we are still here, having the opportunities to really make our wines and to introduce to you what is our production. So uh, as you can see, this is uh, our family trees and this says state of the art since 1435, because actually is the date that my family came to Fonterutoli. So Fonterutoli is gonna be, of course, the protagonist of our tasting because it's our family estate, the historical one is in Castellina and Chianti. So we are talking about 45 minutes driving from Florence and um, is the real heart of our history. So so our brand logo says Matsei 1435, but actually that date is highlighting the moment that we got to Fonterutoli. But we are involved in the wine business since earlier. 
because uh, a protagonist of our family and even of the Chianti classical production wine is Sir Lapo Mazzei. Actually, I have the honor and responsibility to bring the name and uh, he's quite popular among winemakers and in the history of the Chianti wines because Sir Lapo has been the first one to define the Chianti region, so a land, a terroir, as a product. Together with Mr. Datini, he used to write several letters. Um, Sir Lapo, it was a sort of philanthropist, a doctor, merchant. Uh, he was involved in the political aspect of the Florence community. But Mr. Datini was very popular and he still is because he's a sort of creator of the cambiale. So at that moment, the first um, way to exchange credit and debit in economy. So then, of course, after that moment, the Medici family, the beginning of the Fiorino and whatever brings Florence on top of the spot to, to be the banker's town. But what Lapo says to Mr. Datini is quite fun because it is 16 December 1398, and he's talking about three florins, 21 soldi, and eight dinars shall be given by Piero di Tinoriccio for six barrels of Chianti wine. So this is really the first time that a terroir, a region, has defined as a product. So Chianti wine, not Chianti land, Chianti region. And then he says, uh, the affirmation we pay by written letter of Sir Lapo Matzei. So, Sir Lapo, of course, it was a very passionate uh, winemaker, even at that moment. And uh, so, a very famous phrase from his letter, famous in our family, is Don't worry about the cost of the wine, its goodness will make up for its high price. So even in that moment, we were, we were already thinking about premium wine. <laughs> and so this is the beginning of the history of my family into the wine business. Right now, uh, I represent into the company together with my cousin Giovanni, the 25th generation. So is quite a long time that we are involved in this business. And um, here in the picture, there are my uncle, so the chairman and the CEO of the company, my aunt Agnese, that is the our family architect, so the one that has project also the cellar, and uh, our all our hospitality activities, even the restaurant downstairs that Simon were mentioning before. And uh, so, of course, all the rest of the family members are in the board uh, is a, uh, right now is a family company 100%. Just to give you an idea about what we have done even recently, this is our portfolio. As I said, Castello di Fonterutoli is our headquarters since 1435, but in the latest 20 years, we have done some investments in order to extend our production area. So first of all, we went to Maremma with Belguardo, and then in uh, Sicily, at the beginning of the 2000 uh, for Zizola, so we are in the Noto region. And uh, last thing is Villa Marcello, that is a distribution of a very high hand Prosecco from the Veneto region. So, mm, thanks to my parents, because uh, they have done a lot of work. Actually, uh, it's a big pleasure and honor to say is that we are one of the top uh, wine estate in Tuscany and in Italy, accordingly to the results, to the accolades given by the most important critics in the world. So Gambaro Rose, of course, is the most important Italian, James Sacklin, former director of Wine Spectator and now independent critics, Wine Spectator, Robert Parker, Antonio Galloni. So actually we have scored several times very, very good results uh, through our wines. 
So, meanwhile, that Amedeo, that is our wine club coordinator, and the ladies from the British Institute are giving you the first wine of the night, that is our Vermentino. I'm going to introduce you Belguardo. So the Belguardo state is in the Maremma, it's in the southwest. So typical from Sardinia, getting very, very popular in Maremma because the terroir is quite and the climate are quite perfect for this sort of grapes. And then even for the Bordeaux wine style. So Cabernet Sauvignon, Cabernet Franc, these sort of grapes in Maremma fit perfectly. So, Belguardo Vermentino, you are going to taste, I think everybody has a glass, a vintage 2021, so newly released. The character of the Vermentino, generally wise, is the freshness, the saltness, and this wonderful acidity in the end that clean your mouth. So, it's the perfect white wine to be paired with the uh, raw fish, uh, raw meat as well because it has very good persistence so and uh, of course very very enjoyable even for an appetizer before a dinner uh, or in the afternoon so the character of the vermentino is to have this freshness but even having a, a good body so it's a wine that anyway brings has a good shoulder and is consistent in your mouth If you have any question on the wine during the tasting at the end, please feel free to ask uh, whatever you want. Then we move back to so our most important uh, uh, winery. And so, as I said, our headquarters. So we are there since 1435. In the picture, you can start to see our cellar that is right close Fonterutoli that is a medieval hamlet. And actually the design on this cellar has been created, has been thought in order to do not be so visible from the Fonterutoli hamlet and even from the road that passed through the area. Because we wanted to preserve the landscaping of the area. And uh, this is why the 70% of the cellar is under the ground. This is the only part visible that actually is mostly the hospitality part of our cellar. So at that level, we have offices, the wine shop uh, and the tasting room. Then everything is into the ground. Why an investment so big could like a cellar, a contemporary cellar that we have uh, that is working since uh, 2007. Because before, as a family, during the time, we did lots of investment in terms of vineyards. So what you have can see right now is uh, our terroir, seven different areas around the Castello di Fonterutoli, where actually we do our wines, uh, where actually we have our uh, vineyards. So Siepi, probably the name 
uh, is the most popular wine of our portfolio, so the names maybe bring something to you, is uh, seven kilometers from Castello di Fonterutoli and is part of our property since the beginning. Then we have Cornia, Cagiolo, Badiola, Fonterutoli, Vicoregio and Belvedere. What about easily the difference? What makes Fonterutoli so special or what are we trying to do in order to highlight the character of Fonterutoli? is the difference in terms of terroir, exposition, and the altitude. So actually we go from 220 meters, so the lowest point is Siepi, to the highest point that is 570 meters. This big, big gap, this big, big difference means several things, that not all the vintage are the same in each area, because in a warmer vintage, it could be favorite the highest part, so the Badiola, or in a very cold year that actually we are not facing so much recently, uh, it could be, of course, the lowest part. Then the difference between the soil could be an area with much more rocks, so much more mineral, and it could be an area with much more sandy sort of land. So the idea of having so many different land different terroir, then we have to transfer it into the cellar. And as you can see, we say that there are 114 different parcels. So each hectare of the estate is divided in one parcel. And then once we move to the cellar, we treat all of them separately. So we do a real made to measure work on each hectare of our property. Sorry? Yeah, so mostly of them are Sangioveses. We work with 36 different clones of Sangiovese. So just to give you an idea, it's like having a rose. A rose could be white, red, and blue. So the Sangiovese is the most important grape of the Chianti Classico region. And in the years we have studied and we have even made muscle clones, selection from muscles and then new clones of Sangiovese. So actually 11 of these 36 biotypes of Sangiovese are owned by my family. So are exclusive. A very, very important argument uh, right now, of course, is the sustainability. Uh, we are really focusing on that. Just to give you an idea, our Zizola estate, so the one in Sicily, is in the, um, is in the changing to become a bio winery, so a bio estate a bio estate and the Castello di Fonterutoli, we have a different approach that is about the sustainability management. So organic fertilization, uh, ledge shaped terraces uh, uh, and several other activities on managing the winers. So we are back to the cellar. As I said before, 70% of the cellar is down the ground. So this one is the only visible part, the highest level. And then we have two other level that are created to a concept that is the gravity. So the idea of the cellar, it was to treat separately all the 114 parcel and then to keep the quality of the grapes. And to do that, we do not stress the bunches. So we do not use any sort of pump. So what's happened? The grapes arrive at this level. Then through the gravity, we move to the vinification level where actually we have 78 different tanks in order to do the punching of each single actor. After that is a process that takes from 16 to 30 days, it depends on the kind of grapes, it depends on plenty of things. We move to the barrels room, even in this case through the gravity. And in the barrels room, we are going to age, even there, separately, all our parcel. So 
until this moment, actually, no, you cannot have in your hand no one of the wine that we uh, uh, that we will taste, because the master blend. So how we are going to make the Fonteruto di Chianti Classico, the CIP of the Serlapo, is not done yet. We, of course, we know that CIP comes from some specific parcel that actually are in some specific barrels, but then how many and uh, which is going to be the percentage of one compared to another one is going to be decided after six, eight months of aging. Yes. So I'm going to, of course, the this side, so the mid-level, the vinification part, all the tank are controlled. So we are all, we can do warmer, cold, we can have specific program also because, for example, the vinification of a white grapes needs different temperature than the red wine. So in that area, everything is, of course, under control, but not the climate, but the single tank. Once we go in the barrel's room, As you can see, at the end, there is a rock. There is a big rock with waterfall, natural waterfall. So once we dig it in the ground, 16 meters to create, of course, the area to then build up our winery, we discover lots of water. We knew that, of course, there was this opportunity because actually Fonte Rutile from Latin, Font Rutile, of course, is a place where actually there are sergeant of water, but we didn't know that actually part was there. So we changed the project in this area. Agnese and my hand did a massive work together with the engineer in order to benefit of this production of water. How? To keep the temperature and the humidity in the barrel's room constantly from 14 degrees to 19 degrees and from 75% of humidity to 99% without using any machine. So not air conditioning, not the humidificator or vice versa. So the barrel's room has a very natural environment and climate. So this one I think is probably even of course in terms of impressing our visitors, uh, the uh, view of the barrel's room uh, is very, very particular and makes a lot in terms of communication. But what is even more important is technically wise, is sustainable. So in the meantime, that they are going to take back the glass of the Vermentino and uh, giving you the Fonte Ruto Licanti Classico, just a few words on our benchmark wine. I mean, Fonte Ruto is uh, our most productive wine. We are talking about 300,000 bottles per year. And uh, it's really, really fundamental for us because uh, the black label, the brand uh, is the, even the most popular in the world. You have to, from, of course, from our winery, you have to consider that we have a distribution in 75 different countries, more or less. And this wine is our entry door. So is the wine that really connects buyers, consumers, or any sort of customer to our winery. Then, of course, our focus quality-wise, our research is on the premium, premium, premium wine. But this one for us is true, really too important. And is the sort of wine that you have to produce every year. What I mean with that, once you have a sort of not a good vintage, you can even skip the release and the production of your icon wine. We are talking about few bottles. You cannot uh, miss quality-wise a vintage. 
So it's better to skip a production for one year in order to um, in order to release on the market a product not at the level the, of the customer expectation or even the critics expectation. So the point is then the risk is they're gonna kill you in terms of scoring, in terms of uh, word of mouth. But for a wine like this one, we cannot miss it. Otherwise the winery close. So <laughs> this one is real a topic uh, all the years. Fortunately, we are coming from several good vintages so we are in a good shape but uh, it's um, it's a massive e effort every time uh, Fonterutoli is a 93 percent Sangiovese all the time that I talk about Sangiovese remember what I said before the 36 different clones of Sangiovese so we have a big varieties of Sangiovese and then we have a seven percent of complementary grapes. We're talking about autochthons grapes. So like Malvasianera, Colorino, typical of the Chianti Classico region. Sort of grapes, not very powerful in terms of structure, but in terms of flavor, very pleasant, very intriguing. So we use them in a small percentage in order to complete the taste of our Chianti Classico. Everybody has a glove? Perfect. So I'm going to take it one as well. Hmm? Okay. So we're talking about vintage 2019. So one of the best ever. Everybody think that the 2010, uh, probably you heard about, is uh, on top of the list uh, quality wise. From our side, uh, we expect that 2019. Uh, is going to be even better. Of course, Fonterutoli is uh, a, a fresh release on this vintage. The Icon wine has a longer aging period. So we are going to launch them at the end of this year or at the beginning of the next one. But our expectation is if we have been able to make a Chianti Classic of Fonterutoli of this vintage with this structure with this flavor with this quality how it's gonna be with our real top of the list wine so thank you the wine is unfortunately i cannot speak too much about the color because it's hard to be seen but um, the taste of this wine um, and generally with the Sangiovese, the character of the Sangiovese is the elegance, is the acidity, is a very sensitive grape, so has to be treated perfectly all the time. Even the process that I was explaining before, gravity, no pump, no stress, is because the Sangiovese is quite particular. Together with the Nebbiolo, are the most real, the most sensitive grapes. If you compare with the Cabernet, Cabernet grows well almost together, almost everywhere. It is in fact, is the most inter international grapes. It's planted in US, in French, in Italy, and uh, almost everywhere in the world. So the Sangiovese has this specific character, elegance, finest, great acidity, and uh, you can feel the, the bush, so a bit of um, red cherry, black cherry, sorry. So this is generally why are the main aspect that you can find on a Sangiovese wine. And uh, what makes, I think, Fonterutoli very pleasant. And so a good wine for every day, because finally we are again discovering the importance of drinkability. There has been a period where actually everybody was doing wine, even us, uh, very concentrate, uh, where actually since the release, you can feel the vanilla of the oak, uh, uh, very powerful, but lack in drinkability. Wine, I used to call it cheeseburger wine. So wine that actually after two glasses, uh, you were a bit tired. This new style from... Uh, 
our idea of winemaking, I would say in the latest 10 years, but also from many, many, many others producers is much more focusing on enjoy the wine, enjoy the drinks, enjoy the glass and the bottle has to be finished. So Fonterutoli, honestly, I think it respects itself perfectly, this idea. So a very, very, very enjoyable wine, but with structure, character and elegance. Sorry, is a 13.5, I would say. Yeah. So, Serlapo, actually. Serlapo is our, uh, I give you, a quick introduction about one aspect of the Chianti Classico. So the Chianti Classico is probably the most popular appellation in the world because the trademark of the Gallo Nero is recognized everywhere. But the problem is actually the Chianti Classico for a long time has been perceived as not exclusive wine, but a wine for every day because the success of the Chianti Classico is paired generally wise, uh, particularly once you go internationally to you, some place, US, South America, Asia, and so on, with the idea of the fiasco. So what's happened in the last 30 years uh, in the Chianti Classico has been, uh, have been done a massive work in order to create an awareness of exclusive wine. So then the Appellation Chianti Classico had been split in three categories. Chianti Classico, so Fonterutoli, the wine that we were drinking before. Serlapo, I mean, I'm talking about, of course, our wine, as a Chianti Classico Riserva. And then the last one is the Chianti Classico Gran Selezione, that is the highest point in terms of jerky in the Chianti Classico production, wine, wine production. So which is the difference between Riserva and Chianti Classico Dannata? So between Serlapo and Fonterutoli production wise? Actually, I have to say not too much. In terms of appellation, the rules are not so different. And this is why 10 years ago, the many winemakers from the region have decided to push the introduction of a new category that is the Grand Selezione. But of course, from our side, uh, there is a different approach between the Chianti Classico Dannata and the Chianti Classico Riserva, so Serlapo. First of all, uh, is our idea of Chianti Classico a bit more international. So before we were talking about only Sangiovese and autochthone grapes, so Malvasia and Colorino. Right now in the Serlapo, there is a 10% of Merlot. So Merlot is together with Cabernet, the most international grapes in the world. And in terms of character is famous to be full body, massive, very strong, very colorful. So, Compared with the wine that you have tasted before in the Serlapo, I think you will feel much more structure, um, maybe a bit less acidity in the end, and uh, a bigger uh, persistency. That, from my side, not all the time match with the idea of elegance. But of course, as I said, we have to approach in different way our wines in order to create different target. So Fonterutoli Chianti Classico is really our traditional idea of Chianti Classico. Serlapo, that right now is probably our most successful wine in the market, is our most international idea of the Chianti Classico. So matching the Sangiovese together with the Merlot, giving it much more structure thanks to the Merlot that is the powerful grape on the market. The vintage is 2019 as well. And so, as I said before, a very nice one. And uh, of course, 
the wine is dedicated to Sor Lapo, the, the smart guy, the wine lover that we were talking before at the beginning of our introduction. Recently, this wine has scored incredible results, honestly, considering even the positioning. We are talking about a very affordable wine and not a, a super expensive, uh, uh, tiny production. And so, in fact, uh, for example, from Wine Spectator, that is definitely the most important uh, critics, magazine critics of wine, has been considered as a smart buy. So, is a very, very, very um, interesting, intriguing wine with a very good price. Lots. Um, unfortunately, <laughs> no, particularly on, uh, on the icon wine. I mean, uh, once we are in the category of mid-high wine in terms of price point, we are talking about retail price. Ponte Luthor is a wine that costs 17 euros, Serlapo 20 euro. Of course, there is an influence, uh, but uh, it doesn't change the paradigm if you get the top score or not. It helps a lot, uh, but once we talk about the icon, so the tiny exclusive premium production, it changes everything. If you get 99 points from Wine Spectator, you almost know that the day after your wine is sold out. So you have, you have to turn off your phone, uh, <laughs> raise the price. <laughs> And then after a couple of months, start selling again. So no, no, definitely. In fact, uh, uh, it's of course is a pain because uh, you have to take care of everything once you have the opportunity to meet them. And it's incredible how many wine they taste per year. Because and in your perception, you think that they know everything but actually cannot be like that. So you have to be very smart and very precise on giving them the right information, the right insight to let them discover how is made your wine, what is behind the production of your wine. But then the tasting, generally they do that at the beginning, once you are in early release moment. So the wine generally wise is not in the perfect shape of course it takes a bit of time to age in the bottle to get in the perfect tasteful moment so is uh, is a massive job honestly and in fact many wineries not not us but i have to say that my cousin giovanni is really good on that are having they have pr office director of the winery and so on that are really focusing on having the opportunity to meet them one to one is already a great chance to get some very high result. Of course, the quality of the wine is fundamental. The black rooster, right? Yeah. The Black Rooster is on uh, only the Chianti Classico wine. So is the same. So in our case, yeah. And no, even Serlapo. So even the second one, just to give you an idea, there is a Black Rooster on the back label. It's mandatory to show the Black Rooster. Actually, we have shift for the Sangiovese from the traditional barrels, so the 225 liters, so the, the traditional French barrique, to the tonneau, so 500 liters, so double it, the barrique, because on the Sangiovese, that, as I said, is very sensitive in terms of aging, in terms of finding the tannins, we thought that the tonneau is better. Of course, the period of aging into the tonneau is a bit longer. So giving you an idea, uh, Castello Fonteluto, this is our top production of Sangiovese. Before moving to the tonneau, the aging period, it was more or less 16 months. 
now since 2015 that everything is on to the to new is 18 20 months then then we move to philip what about philip and his red chick so philip uh, together with sadlapo is definitely our most successful ancestor. I think we are not going to replicate what they have done. And uh, he, he made a lot of things. He was a doctor, he was a philosophist, and then he was an illuminist, and then he was the erratic guy of the family. So he decided to move from Florence Carmignano, from actually we come from, to Turkey and then to to London. So he made plenty of things. Huh? But this, I have to say that his story is so intriguing that a few years ago, we decided to make a small video together with a, a Florentine artist that uh, if you don't mind, I would like to show you because it's the perfect recap of what that guy has done. Please allow me to introduce myself. I am Filippo Mazzei, the scion of a very old family, but you may call me Philip. I was born in Tuscany, near Florence. I studied medicine, and my early professional travels took me far from home. The year 1754 was an interesting one for me. I became the Grand Duke of Tuscany's business emissary to London. His Highness was interested in an American invention, namely Benjamin Franklin's revolutionary stove. At the court of St. James's, I met Ben Franklin and John Quincy Adams. After a long ocean voyage, I arrived in Virginia. My journey to the American colonies was commercial in nature. I loaded my ship with olive trees, grapevines, some farmers, and my tailor. Through my friend Adams's good graces, I met General Washington and Thomas Jefferson. Jefferson was my host in Virginia. He allotted me part of his Monticello estate, which I rebaptized Il Colle. I planted my Tuscan vines in New World soil. My part in the American Revolution was to write treatises in which I denounced British domination of the colonies for all the world to hear. In all modesty, my phrase, all men are by nature equally free and independent, is echoed in the Declaration of Independence. We hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal that they are endowed by their creator with certain inalienable rights, and that among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. In 1785, I traveled to Paris and found myself in the thick of yet another revolution. It was there that I first established contact with his majesty, King Stanislaus of Poland. And so I've returned to my native land and resumed my study of viticulture. What joy to be remembered.
This wine is supple, soft, with silky tannins, and an intriguing touch of complex, exotic character. It is the quintessence of Tuscany. Philip embodies the new world spirit of Tuscan winemaking and expresses the desire to pursue life, liberty, and happiness. So as, as I said before, the story of Philip is quite remarkable and difficult for us to be replicate. So, and uh, no, it's a real pleasure. I mean, uh, talking about Philip uh, is uh, something special because honestly, in Italy, almost no one knows about him. And the idea of making a wine dedicated to to Philip uh, comes also from this aspect. Uh, so we wanted to highlight the story of our ancestor that really ha has done so much. And uh, it was a real citizen of the world. When I think about traveling at that period, moving from Tharkey to British to French, again, Tuscany, then US, then to Varsav. So, of course, it wasn't like right now that you get on a plane and in a few hours you move there. So he had done really lots. And uh, once we decided to make this wine, of course, for us, have been a different project. Even the label, as you have seen, is totally a, a new trend compared to the classic one that we have presented to you so far. Because this label comes from the stamp, that the US government has dedicated to him. And we did it together with the University of Design from New York that has a school even in Florence. And uh, it was an exam for the class. So we have mixed and mixed and matched plenty of ideas coming from the students in order to get to the final result of the image of Philip. Another very topic moment in the 2014 is one we have introduced to the market for the first time, this wine hosted by the Thomas Jefferson Foundation in Monticello. So actually in front of Il Colle. So the place where actually Philip used to live during that period, hosted by Jefferson. And um, in terms of tasting, of course, we had to do something that really brings the spirit of the Italian winemaker and the US winemaker. So, we could not, we had to start from the Cabernet Sauvignon that actually is the most popular grapes in the US and is so important even in the Italian viticulture. So Philip is 100% Cabernet Sauvignon. Then in terms of style, we wanted to do something in between. Uh, the American Cab are really powerful, sometimes a bit oaky, but uh, with uh, uh, big structure, full body wines. And uh, the Italian one generally wise are a bit more classic, fine, but not so power. So the idea, it was to make a wine that really could connect this sort of two style of winemaking, something in between. And to do that, technically, we have to blend uh, the grapes coming from two different wineries. So the Cabernet Sauvignon that we use for the Philip wine, part is in Belguardo, so in the Maremma region, part is in the Castello di Fonterutoli. So we find out this blend, trying with all the cab that we had in our production, uh, with the objective of really making something a bit unusual, let's say, for our wine style, but that could be really in between of the idea of the American cab. So tonight we're tasting the Philip 2018, and uh, I think that is a, is a good representative, is a good representation of our idea of when making the Cabernet Sauvignon. So 
with Philip, I think I talk too much. Sorry if I bother you so long. And uh, the last thing is about the opportunity that we thought we together with Simon to give to the members of the British Institute. So uh, we have a nice, I think it's a nice wine club that uh, has been an idea of Francesco Mazzei, the actual CEO of the company and my uncle. So it's a way to be in touch, it's a way to give the opportunity to, to enjoy our wine, to acquire our wine in a faster and convenient and exclusive way. And of course, it's even a, a great access to our hospitality because all our club members, once they visit us, in, uh, even at the Belguardo restaurant here in Florence, but in all our winery, we have a special treatment for them, special condition. And uh, Amedeo that is here with me is our wine club coordinator. So he spent all the time taking care about our club members. And uh, of course, if you would like to join us or if you would like to just visit us in Castello di Fonterutori, it's gonna be my pleasure welcoming you at our estate. So. Thank you a lot. Well, th thank you so much, um, Lapo, for that really interesting insight into the story and your illustrious ancestors, and also this, these four wines that we've enjoyed so much in the room. I'm so sorry, Zoomers, that you couldn't taste the wine, and this particular session was not really very well designed for zoom because it was a lot about the wine we're having in the room um but we will um put up on the website uh, details about the wine club and you can order wine from all over the world right Absolutely. yeah so uh, the, so you can get a hold of the wine and um when you're in florence the the, the belguardo restaurant for the matze is literally underneath the, the, the library it's right underneath where we're standing um jennifer my wife and i go there all the time and I think many of you will know it. Uh, it is a very good restaurant, and it, of course, it's a designed to s showcase the wines. You, you drink the wines there in good condition with the right food to go with you. Have a very enjoyable time. Let's you say. can much and, more and, than showcasing uh, the wine. And I think I think Lapa was suggesting that pe people from the British Institute can get a special deal done. Absolutely, yeah. absolutely. So, there is so, going to be a guy called Leone that will recognize all of you. Yeah, Leone is a guy, and, and Claudio is his boss. Just say you're a friend to the British Institute, you're hanging out with Simon and Lapo, and they'll look after you. Yeah, All right, so as always, if there's anyone in the room who wants to ask a question, or really give the Zoomers a chance, because the room's been chatting all the time, um, I'm now going to use the microphone so the Zoomers can hear what we're talking about. So here we do have a question. The Grand Selection wine. Sorry, the Grand Selezione. Yes, of course. We have actually we produce three different Grand Selezione because uh, all of them are crew wine. So coming from a specific vineyard. In the slide that uh, the one that was showing uh, all the terroir, one is coming from Fonterutoli, one from Belvedere, and one from where I'm from Badiola, and one from Vicoregio. And uh, I have to say that from Castello di Fonterutoli Winery right now is the most important project because it's the one really focusing on highlighting the difference between uh, terroir. So altitude, terroir, exposition makes different character of the wine. And these three Grand Selezione are all of them 100% Sangiovese, but one is produced at 300 meters, one at 450 and one at 570. And really, you can taste different uh, uh, character, different uh, structure, different uh, flavor. What are the These three prices? Grand Selezione are all at the same price. So we don't want to, uh, how to say, highlight or support much more one of the three. This is why we decided to release them on the market at the same level. 570. So I have to say that it was almost impossible uh, till up to 10 years ago, thinking to make Sangiovese at this sort of altitude. So there is a climate changing. I have to focus on it. And uh, of course, in our case, but in the Chianti Classico region, 
is killing the lowest part or is making harder to make swine in the lowest part of the region, but uh, is extending the production area to highest limit, to higher limit that before was impossible to reach. Thank you. Thank you for your wonderful lecture. Um, in the last few months, I've had the opportunity to be drinking from a very good friend's collection, a 1959 Chianti classic from Fossey. Whoa. The, cork, the cork was rotten, it was starting to leak. I decanted it and it reminded me of your for, first wine, that we, red wine that we tasted tonight. And I mean, I just can't believe that that's 60, 50 years old and it's just been magnificent. And then I'm, I'm moving on to 1973 now. And I hate to think if, if, if the wine is worth lots of money in the antique wine business, the old wine business. Anyway, it's been amazing. And I'd love to talk to you about it later. Thank you so much. I have to say that this is a very... It's a very nice privilege to have the opportunity to taste the wine from a vintage, a Chianti class, Sangiovese wine from that vintage, and uh, real pleasure. Lapa, we have a we have a question from the Zoom from Brenda. She says, "Is the name of your vineyard state of Tuscan origin?" I suppose she's talking about Fonte Rutoli. Ponte Rutoli is it a Tuscan name. Is a Latin name uh, coming from, of course, I think it was part of the Tuscan tradition, but uh, it comes from Latin. Any more questions in the room? Yes, we have got a question. She said so much. I'm sorry. This is a funny question. Perhaps last year this time we did not know that there was going to be a frost end of April, May, and we are in the middle of vineyards near Popiano, and there was a lot of damage. Montalcino had lost. A... Do Are we confident that this year we're going to, you, not we, you, uh, but uh, it's unclear whether you did lose anything last year, but are, are, are we optimistic this year? La, la, thank you for the question. Uh, it is quite strange because uh, in the latest three years, because starting from the year of the explosion of the pandemia, so 2020, we are facing in the same period in French and Italy, the same phenomena. So the the temperature goes down under zero at the beginning of April after a very warm March. That actually is a big problem because generally if it's a warm March, the plant goes uh, fast. And then so a, a change of temperature that goes minus zero so fast uh, is really makes damage. So in 2020, we, we faced a big problem and we lost a 20% of production in the area of the Chianti Classico. Last year, actually, in the Chianti Classico region, we were not so, um, so ahead with the maturation of our plants, but unfortunately, we were there with the Maremma winery. So in Maremma, we have faced like a 40% loss, particularly on grapes like Syrah and the Cabernet Franc. So, I mean, this year is happening again in French. Actually, it looks like that in Tuscany, we are safe. I hope so. There has been, of course, at the beginning of April again, a, a sort of storm in terms of temperature, but not so strong like in the 2021 and the 2020. But generally, it is happening frequently. In the last 48 hours, um, I, we have witnessed the vines, uh, the, the leaves growing off the vines, just, just literally overnight. Um, it's gone from stark uh, branches to green. That's a good thing. That's, that's a good thing, yeah. actually, because it looks like 
they have been not damaged before, so they're still growing. And so there is the moment of the maturation. So they are, um, I do not remember the exact word. Uh, anyway, they're bunching. So it's a good sign. Yeah. No, no, no. You want, uh, yeah, yeah. So, like, okay. So, I back in the day, I worked in the Australian wine industry, right? And uh, um, so it was there was a real consistency in that industry in terms of if you knew the right year, the right region, the right grape, you were guaranteed essentially to get really high quality, a high quality drop of, of whatever you're looking for. If you knew how to look for those three th few things, I mean, I'm not saying like South Australia, it'd be more region specific. So within South Australia, you might know you have famous regions like the Barossa Valley, Eden Valley, these are region specific. So if you knew how to match the specific region, what grapes grow well there and what year was good, didn't really matter that the maker, the grapes were so good that you were going to oh. get really high quality <clears throat> wine. And I feel like it's probably from ignorance. I don't, I feel like the, the wine I've drank in Tuscany has been a lot more hit and miss. And I wonder if there's a similar, similar formula when approaching buying wine here to know that you're getting the right, the right grape from the right place at the right time, if that makes sense. Um, my comment, my first comment is generally, you see the great makers, not in, a, not in to the good vintage, but in the bad vintage. So the great makers can make the difference much more once is in a difficult situation than in the perfect situation. So is generally wise, it's easier to make, uh, of course, terroir kind of vintage, kind of grapes are the base. Then the technique in the latest 50 years has evolved a lot and actually making good wines is possible i have to say almost everywhere now you can drink good wine from almost everywhere in the world i've been surprised plenty of time in my travels trying domestic wines from the southeast from very small island from uh, an island in greece that was really a, a nectar of piece of land and the quality of the wine was definitely good because there has been a lots of evolution in how do we treat the grapes and how we can process them but of course then we reach a, a level once you want to raise your quality and you want to really reach the maximum expression of quality the terroir how you manage the grapes the vintage and all the things, the kind of oak that you decide to pair with this specific wine, everything makes the difference to get to the top level. Is there like a common knowledge about like, because you think, okay, Tuscan as a whole, and you think Tuscany, Sanchevese, Primitivo, okay, and obviously other stuff, which I'm very ignorant to, but you know, these are the, the grapes that come to mind, but are there... Is there a sort of knowing that this specific micro region within Tuscany is famous for this specific grape? And it's important to know that kind of stuff. Or is it sort of just Montalcino Tuscany, is Tuscany definitely Sangiovese? Montalcino you know I mean? is famous for a, a kind of Sangiovese. The yeah. Bulgari region is perfect for the Bordeaux wine, so from the Bordeaux style wine, so the Cabernet. You cannot plant the Sangiovese there. And uh, as well, the south of Maremma is good only on the top level in terms of altitude to grow the Sangiovese, so the Morellino. I mean, Tuscany is a land of diversity and actually the good makers is the one that choose the right spot for the specific grapes. So this is why we have so many wineries and so many wine and so many styles. In, in the chat, Christine wants to know how long you can keep uh, the Vermentino before drinking it. I mean, the Vermentino now is in the top of the freshness. But for me, for example, I prefer a Vermentino that it goes much loose for a bit of flavors in terms of fruits, uh, peach, 
but uh, you feel much more the saltness and the minerality. So actually, Vermentino can go for three, four, five years without any problem. Of course, the taste is going to change a bit. It's going to evolve to different perception. I see Christine's got a glass or something there, but you're enjoying it. <laughs> well, uh, <laughs> very good. Uh, Vic, did you want to come back in? Can you uh, stop the uh, the frost in some way by heating or fire? It's a, or it's a massive investment. We did it in the 2020 to trying to save our most important vineyard, the one that is dedicated to the production of a wine that for us is really the, the iconic one. Uh, we did it with candles, is a technique that we learned from uh, Bordeaux, perhaps in 2020 and even this year have been used by Bordeaux makers again, fortunately not from our side. I mean, you can try for some really few hectares, otherwise the cost of making this sort of uh, natural defense fence versus the temperature is unaffordable. So for 120 hectares, not possible. For three specific hectares, we try to do it and somehow it worked. One from me also on climate, is, um, since the turn of the year, January onwards, it's been incredibly dry in Tuscany. There's been very little rain. Is that a problem or is that an advantage? It is, I have to say, for everything, uh, not only for the viticulture, because it's really the, it's really incredible that it's almost 100 days that is not raining consistency consistent. but for the the character of the grapes uh, is uh, is quite incredible because it's really really um, resilient so uh, of course uh, there is a, a shift in the latest years and uh, we are facing much more dry vintage than before but uh, the grapes so the vineyard are evolving as well. So if you think that Sicily is probably the driest place uh, and we have a winery in Noto, so we are really in the southest part of the Sicily. Last year, not even a, a bit of rain during the summer period and in August, 45 degrees. And actually 2021 for the Sicilian wine has been probably one of the best. So. The grapes is really, really resilient. Of course, a bit of water is really helpful right now, particularly for the quantity, of course, uh, also for the quality, but quantity-wise, the water is very important. Any more? I think we're probably coming towards the end. There's one more over here. Yeah. Uh, my question, it's a good follow-up on what you were just talking about is, um, I'm curious as to whether, you know, what kind of strategizing you're doing with regard to climate change. This is a, it's a, it's a, big, it's a big question. I mean, we are discussing a lot about that. And uh, of course, for example, in a region like Maremma, we need to create much more water tank, natural water tank in order to afford a very dry summer because there you really need to support the grapes and the maturation because the sort of the kind of land does not absorb too much water during the winter. Different characteristic than the Chianti region where for example, the kind of terroir is really good on keeping the water and then releasing it during the summer, the spring and the summer time. So this is, for example, is one thing that we are really approaching. So making investment in order to enlarge the capacity of keeping the water. And uh, in Sicily, a different approach in terms of viticulture. This is why it's becoming also a bio winery because there, there are a sort of natural treatment that should support more the maturation of the grapes even in a dry year. And then, for example, there we did it the alberello instead of the classic uh, guyo. So the vineyard in Sicily is a sort of single tree and uh, 
that covers much more the bunches. So the uh, very sunny day, the very high temperature phenomena are a bit uh, uh, bare by the uh, structure of the grapes, by the structure of the vineyard. It's a very expensive practice and you have to manage all manually. We do that even on the traditional kind of vineyard, but the alberello really costs lots of man, manpower hour in order to be managed, but uh, is a sort of shade from the sun. Okay, well, um, I think we've probably reached the end of the session. Um, I just want to say a couple of things. Um, th thanks to this, uh, our friendship and our partnership with the Matse, um, we're going to be enjoying Matse wines for the next couple of months at these events. Um, so that's another reason to keep coming to the Wednesday lectures and the concerts, starting with the great concert tomorrow night. Uh, and don't forget to pick up your leaflet where you get your opportunity to join the club and get the special discounts for the wines uh, and also downstairs at the restaurant. It's all very good. Um, so it's, it's really d delightful um, that we've got this um, friendship going with the match. So it's worth mentioning, we might not all know this, that Auntie Agnese, who designed the, uh, is the architect who, who built the cellars, served as a governor of the British Institute for many years until she um, came off the board a couple of years ago. So the, the, the connection with the Matse goes, goes back a while and um, we're delighted to have it. So it's been a, a great pleasure to have you with us, Lapo, and thank you so very much for all of us. Um, and for, for the Zoomers, I'm sorry it's been a frustrating evening in terms of not being able to taste the wine, um, but it gives you an, a reason to get yourself back here before the, um, before the summer comes, whilst we still got Matse wine being served at the British Institute. And thanks for your participation. We'll see you all again next week. Thank you. All right. And I think there's more wine to be drunk if you want another drop. I and mean, the, the bottles are open. I don't think it, 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 it keeps. So um, get yourself a little, little drop more if you'd like it.